think our kids are uh, heading out, but if you don't already know, we have uh, both our toddler's church and our children's church meeting this morning, so if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, feel free to do that. As I said earlier, this is the first Sunday of Lent, uh, and there's a lot of traditional ways to do that. We aren't necessarily doing that in a very traditional way in terms of our scripture reading. Instead, I'm going to ask you, just like I did over the last few weeks, to dig in a little deeper with me into one book of the Bible. Over the last few weeks, we looked at one book. What was that book? Habakkuk, that's right. You could sneeze that word out and uh, skip over that book. That's how small it is. Um, and it also sounds like a sneeze when you say it, so that's fine. First uh, Peter's about the same. That's where we're going to go. We're going to go to the New Testament this time, not the Old Testament. Uh, and we're going to look at the book of First. Peter. Peter. Now, the Lenten journey is an interesting journey. It, it does not, as I remind us sometimes, and for those who are new to church or maybe aren't a part of churches that celebrate Lent, it's not the stuff in your belly button, right? It's not L-I-N-T. That's not what we're doing. Lent, or the Lenten journey, is L-E-N-T. It comes from an old English word, Lenten, uh, and it sounds like what it is, to lengthen. It's about the day's lengthening. It's springtime, right? That's what this is. It's another way of saying springtime has come. And, and ancient and medieval Christians were much more attuned to the seasons than we are today. And they oftentimes oriented their lives and their religious practice around the seasons. So, for instance, as they jumped into the springtime season, the season of Lent, the Lenten season, where everything is getting longer, daylight is getting longer, they oriented their lives towards the day where the light would become fully known in the world, the day of resurrection. And so they took this period of time, as I'm encouraging you to do, those who are joining online, in-house, they used this time as a, prayer, as a time of prayer and fasting and reflection, leading into that day in which the light would fully be known, we could celebrate the resurrection hope that is before us, and we could start to live into all of that. But we do that by remembering where we come from, by remembering that we are but dust, and to dust we shall return. That's how we start this season off, and that's where we go. And there's an important part of that that grounds us in the earthiness, the difficulties, and the trials of life. And so we often begin this season out by looking at the temptation stories, the way in which Jesus engaged the temptations uh, that the, the devil or the tempter would come and offer to him in the desert. We begin in this way to think about the trials and the challenges of our lives. And the truth is, that's exactly what we're going to find in 1 Peter. That's why I think it's so perfect. In fact, it's, a, it's an interesting pairing between Habakkuk and 1 Peter because Habakkuk and 1 Peter share so much in common. In both of these spaces, they're both tiny books, right? Three chapters in Habakkuk, five chapters in 1 Peter. They're tiny books. Uh, but they both were written in challenging seasons of life under foreign occupation. This is interesting. Both of them lived under the weight of outside forces coming in, ruling and dominating in our lives in a way that we didn't ask for or want, but it happened. And both are trying to figure out in the midst of that what God is doing in those seasons. Now, here's the difference between the two, and it's, it's the reason why I think these dovetail so well. In Habakkuk, if you remember, Habakkuk is often offering his complaints to God, unlike all the other prophets who are speaking for God to the people, Habakkuk is speaking for the people to God. And he's complaining to God, and he's offering that complaint to God, and he's waiting for God's answer in the middle of that complaint. Here's what First Peter's doing. First Peter is not directing his comments to God. He's not complaining to God along with us in our world. Instead, he directs his comments to you and me. He directs his comments, and we see this from the very opening verse of First Peter, to the churches who are scattered abroad in Asia Minor. And we'll get back to that in a minute. But this is an important distinction because Habakkuk gives us, gives you and me the room where we can offer our complaints to God. First Peter steps in and says, okay, you got to deal with the, the reality that's around you. How do you deal with it as a faithful follower of Christ? How do you live into that and live in a victorious way? And so that's exactly how Habakkuk is going to start out. He's going to recognize that we're scattered. In fact, he'll get pretty quickly into the reality that we're suffering. But he's going to name this scattered reality all around us. In fact, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to them in your pew Bibles. Uh, it's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. He tells us on the front end, and I'm going to take my time today because we've got several weeks to get through this five-chapter little book, but I'm going to take my time setting this up for you today. 
He says at the very beginning, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, this is important, right? Unlike us who sign our names at the last, they had scrolls. We're not going to open the scroll all the way to figure out who it is. Like, if we want to read it or not, we're going to open it right away. We're going to see who wrote it to us, and it happens to be Peter. And I'll explain a little bit more about him later. But as soon as the people saw this, they were like, oh, we should pay attention to this. This is Peter who walked with Christ. This is Peter who, who was the leader of the church. This is Peter who's now in Rome. We should pay attention to this. And then he addresses them. So he tells them who is writing. And then look at how he describes them in the next part of this verse. To the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now these are all places in modern day Turkey, but they're all churches scattered abroad. And what's interesting about this is the way that he describes them. He describes them in the exact same way that most of the prophets would describe the people that they were talking to. Exiles. They're not in a land they wanted to be in. It's not their homeland. And they're not living under rule that they wanted to live under. It's not righteous. They're living under foreign rule. And Peter says, this is who you are. We think about the exiles of old. We think about the exiles that Habakkuk and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and all of those dealt with and and talked about. But right here... As Christians living in this first century world, we have a group of people who are exiles, a group of people who've been displaced from their homeland, and they are living as foreign captives. Another way of looking at this, and this sort of encapsulates all the complexity to it right away, this is a scattered, suffering group of strangers. That's what he says. You're scattered out. That's the dispersed part, right? You're scattered all about your suffering. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. He talks a little bit about that in later verses. You're a group of strangers. You don't really know each other. You're just traveling through. And in fact, later in the, in the book, he's going to really dig into that, what it means to be aliens in this world, just traveling through to another world. But this is who you are. You're a scattered, suffering group of strangers. And scattered is not really a reality that only first century Christians experience. How many of you felt scattered on your way to church this morning? Got a few? Like, how many of you felt scattered this week trying to get things ready in the morning, get to church or get to, or, I mean, get to work or get to school, right? Scattered is something we often feel. It can be at work. We get there and there's more, more on our plate than we thought or ever could imagine, so we're scattered in that space, right? Our child care doesn't work out. We're scattered because now we're trying to figure this out. Life just gets crazy and we get scattered. And what I've discovered about being scattered in life is being scattered in life is most painful to us as individuals. Because when we're scattered, we feel alone. We feel like we don't have the support around us to, to kind of take care of everything that's on our plate. And so we talk about being scattered like our minds are scattered, but we're also scattered in terms of people scattered. We don't have enough people around us to take care of all of the things. And so the initial emotional response in those spaces like that is I feel alone. I feel like I'm on my own when I try to accomplish this task, and I've got to sort it all out on my own. And that's a painful and a heavy place to be in, and I want to acknowledge that. I think it's true. It is hard to be in that space where you're scattered and you feel alone. But let me also say, and this is what Peter is going to suggest, it's why he names the churches this way. He doesn't hide this reality. Sometimes being scattered is exactly where we need to be. Sometimes being scattered is exactly the space that we need to be. As humans, we love to gather. We're gathering right now, right? We're in this space. We're gathering in this environment, and we love to gather in that place. We don't like to scatter or move out. But scattering is where growth happens in your life. Scattering is the place where you start to experience brand new realities in your life. You get to learn new skills. You get to visit new places in your in your world this is where scattering becomes important we meet new people we grow in ways that we didn't even think were possible because we had never imagined it before whenever we scatter whenever we choose to scatter therefore peter he starts reminding his readers of where they are and he doesn't bemoan that he doesn't say this is a problem he doesn't discourage this he just says this is your reality you're a scattered group of suffering strength strangers And it's in that being scattered that you and I find new life. It's in that being scattered that you and I start to experience the power of new life that can come to us. I mean, think about what Jesus, and I think this is probably what Peter was thinking. He heard Jesus say, unless a seed go into the ground is buried, until then, it can't break and form into new life. Right? It can't break apart. Another way that Jesus would describe us as the people of God, you are salt in the world right and salt is not useful at all unless it's scattered 
Some of you are going to go home this afternoon, sit down for lunch, you're going to grab that salt shaker, and you're going to start scattering it all over the place. And the reason you scatter it is because you find usefulness to the salt when you do that. And if you're anything like the household that I grew up in, you might have a bottle of salt somewhere all way in the back of the, the cabinet that's been there for like two decades. And guess what's happened to that salt that sat in there? Solidified, unless you've got like a ton of rice in it. It's always a trick. Put a ton of rice in the salt shaker, right? It's solidified. And this is an interesting reality for us as the church that the more we gather, the harder it becomes for us to scatter. The more we pull together and, and we don't exercise that scattering that God has called us to, the harder we become. And the harder later on it becomes for us to scatter. And so scattering is always a necessary part of our reality. And Peter wants them to wear it like it's a badge of honor. You're scattered across the world. Great. Grow in it. Live in it. Experience the beauty of that moment and understand that this reality of you being scattered isn't changing anytime soon because God wants us to scatter out in that way. We have, we, we have a creator, and we are sons and daughters of a creator who is, who, who, of course, we're never going to be fully at home until we're reunited with him. But while we're away from him, he wants us to spread out and experience and spread the, the, the gospel of Christ to others. In fact, Augustine, one of the first theologians of the church in the 4th century, he said it so beautifully at the beginning of his confessions. He said, my heart is restless until it rests in thee, O God. That's how we are. As followers of Christ, we will continually be restless with our reality. We'll continue to be uneasy with our reality and we, until we finally find our rest in thee, O God. Until we settle into that place. And if that's you, you would say, right now, Pastor Sam, I am in that space where everything in my world feels out of place. Everything in my world feels turned upside down, and I can't make sense of anything. We live here, but we're exiles, all that kind of stuff. If that's where we are, that is exactly, this book is exactly for you. This is exactly where you need to lean in and listen to what Peter is saying. Because in the next few verses, he's going to tell you that you're scattered, and then he's going to start offering hope in the context of you, be, you being scattered. Right, if that's your reality, he's going to plunge right in with the inheritance and the new life and all the blessings that come with it. So listen, and lean in, and dig deep into this study. But let me also say very clearly to some of you who are in this place and you're like, that's not me, I feel pretty good about life and where I am right now. Don't tune out, okay? Don't, don't just walk away from this because it's not your current setting in life. In fact, it wasn't Peter's current setting in life. We believe Peter wrote this book probably between 62 and 64 AD, somewhere around there. And he would not pass away. He would not experience any persecution at all during the time of writing this book. However, within five years after writing it, if he wrote it in 62, he would be crucified upside down. Right? He wrote this between 62 and 64, and we see that Paul was was actually killed and martyred during that period of time. And so Peter could observe a whole lot of other people around him who were being persecuted and harmed and hurt. But Peter never experienced any of that in and of himself when he wrote this down. Yet the lessons of this letter are still powerful for him in the same way that the lessons of this letter are still powerful for you as you live into this. So hold on to that. Live into that reality. Whether you're in trials currently or not, Peter's words are for us this morning. They're for our comfort and our peace, but... What is his word to us in this season? That's, that's where I just want to get to it. What is his word for us in this season? And that's how we're going to kind of start this off and jump out in this. His word is simply this. Triumph. If we're going through seasons of being scattered and our world is turned upside down, Peter wants to speak triumph and victory into our lives. He wants to remind us of the triumph that is ours, the victory that is ours in all of these ways. And this is exactly how he chooses to start the letter out. He doesn't start, uh, granted, the, the people are suffering deeply in the scattered state of existence. He doesn't start by acknowledging that. He will later. But instead what he does is he acknowledges their scattered reality and then he, he acknowledges the triumph and victory that they have. In fact, if you'll look with me at verse 2, you'll see this. He, says, he, he names them and then he calls them out by who they are. You who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to, Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ, to be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in abundance. You may not have chosen God, but guess what? God chose you. God poured God's self out 
for you. you. He's given you a gift that's better than anything else in this world because he has overcome the world and he's pouring these blessings out upon you and in you. And Peter wants you to focus on that victory. And the reason he wants you to focus on that victory, on that triumph, is because your trials will pale in comparison to God's eternal triumph. Your temporary trials in this world pale in comparison to the eternal triumph that God has bought and purchased through Jesus Christ. And this is what Peter wants you to focus on. You're blessed because of this. You have the whole host of blessings that come to you because of God's victory and what he's done. And for Peter, you're not just waiting for the by and by. You're not just waiting for this to happen later on in life. You don't have to fight through life without ever experiencing any of these blessings. You have the reward of God's triumph right now. These gifts are yours right now to hold and to live into. And that's exactly where Peter takes us next. Look at the next part of the verse, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given. This is the past tense perfect. It has already happened and it is continuing to happen in your life. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So what do we have? What, what, what do we receive in the midst of our trials? We receive this, new life. You have new life right now that you start to experience. When we place our trust in Jesus, there's something, and, and Peter describes it in this way, Jesus describes it in this way, others describe it in this way, there's a violent transformation that occurs, right? They'd, none of the, the New Testament writers ever refer to us being born as, or like talk about us as infants. Instead, they focus on the birth cycle. Right? And, and sometimes they do it in a very graphic way of the pains and the groaning and, and the, uh, the, the pushing that comes with the birth cycle. But all of them want to focus on that part. There is a birth that is, it's hard. It's difficult to move from the life that we are in right now into the life that God wants for us in the future. But this is what he promises you. New life, new birth. And it comes in the midst of trials and it comes in the midst of that weightiness but we know that we have that new life. And we know that we have that new life, as he says, born into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because our Savior lives, we have new life. Another way of thinking this, because we have a living Lord, we have a living hope. Our hope is not dead. Our hope is not pushed aside. But because Christ lives, we too can live and we too can have new life. N.T. Wright, one of my favorite English um, theologians and, and biblical scholars, he says it this way. He says, becoming a Christian means this. It means that what God did for Jesus at, the re- at, at Easter, the resurrection of Jesus' body, he does for you in the very depths of your being. I want you to just let that settle in for a minute. The power of the resurrection that brought Jesus' body back to life, that's what he does inside of you. That's what he imparts into you. A new life that you didn't think you could ever have. A different way of being and thinking and acting and responding and speaking and living in the world. This is what Christ offers to you as each of us place our faith and hope in him and live into that every single day. You have that in the very depths of your being. And as we, as the body in this Lenten season, take that march towards Easter, there's an Easter that has already taken place inside of us. There's an Easter that's already at work in the very beginning, uh, uh, center of our being. And we hold it there. We hold that power of a brand new way of being human right there. It's already existing. And that new way actually comes, uh, comes with all the blessings of a new life. Right? When we enter into a new life, that means there's a whole host of opportunities that are laid before us. And that's the next thing that Peter wants to tell us. He goes, it's not only a new life that you receive, but as you live into this, you also live into an inheritance. There's an inheritance that's yours. There's blessings that come with this. As if you shifted families and your family before, they didn't have a whole lot to offer you in terms of inheritance, but you step into this new life, this family has a whole host of blessings that come with the inheritance. But Peter wants you to be aware of what that inheritance looks like. He says, you coming into an inheritance that is three things, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. These things aren't going away. They're lasting forever. They're blessings like you've never had before. And God keeps them for you in heaven. They're kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. 
And of course, Peter believes he was living in the last time at that moment. So he believes that these, this inheritance is coming even now. This inheritance that Christ has held into the final days is now being poured out into the lives of the church. And the protection that comes along with that is a protection that comes to you and me as being children of God. So God's triumph certainly means new life, but God's triumph also means that you and I have been written into a will. We've been written into a brand new will. And unlike a normal will, where everything in that will is, imper- is perishable, is defiled, has been touched with other human hands, it's fading away, it's worthless basically in another 20 years, the will that you've been written into now, it's un- imperishable. The will that you've been written into now, it's undefiled, it's unfading. And once you're in, you're not going to be fighting over the perishable items, you know? That's what happens when a will is enacted. Siblings and others start to fight over things that are just fading away anyways. But when things are undefiled, when they're imperishable, when they're unfading, we don't see that fighting back and forth. As most wills would divide sons and daughters, this will is different. This will actually creates sons and daughters. It pulls sons and daughters together and it invites us to invite more and to bring more and to do all of those things. We're not driven away from our family because of the will. We're driven into the family because of this will. We're driven into being sons and daughters of God. And it's not a will that's just about belongings. It's a will that's about belonging. Belonging to something new, living into something new. And having that to hold on to every day. So this inheritance is is ours, not because of something we've done, but because of what Jesus did. Right? And because of that, you don't have to like tiptoe around God. You know, this is always a reality for families. Like, I don't want to tick off my great aunt Susie, because when she passes away, I know I'm in her will, but if I tick her off and mess things up, I might be written out. But that's not how this will works. He said the apostle Paul tells us that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. When we were at our worst, we got written into the will. So from here on out, we could just go up, right? There's this place where the will is created in an entirely different way. And you can rejoice here because you know this. You can rejoice in this space because you know this. And that's exactly what Peter encourages. In the same way that Paul would say this in Philippians, Peter in, first, in, in his first letter here, he says this, in this reality that you have new life, that you have an inheritance, I want you to do something. I don't want you to just listen. I want you to do something. I want you to rejoice. In this, rejoice. Even now for a little while, you, if you, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials. Now, let me be clear about what he's saying. He's not saying find joy in your trials. Don't find joy in your trials. Find joy amid your ch- trials. You can find joy while standing amid a trial. You're not happy about what's happening. You're not happy about the trial that's facing you, about the suffering that's going on, about the things that are happening in the world. But trust me, as people of God, as children of, of, of Christ, we can find joy amid our trials. We can stand in the midst of them and still have the joy that comes through him. And so he says to find joy in this. And if you approach life in this way, if you will rejoice even in the midst of that, you're going to approach the seasons of life that are difficult in a very different way yourself. And that's what he goes on to say. He, he says, you can rejoice here because you know that. And you know this, verse 7, so that the genuineness of your faith, the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The authenticity of this new life is, is granted to you and is actually discovered in the middle of your trials. It's in the middle of your trials that everything you thought you believed, that you were just holding on to by faith, it becomes authentically revealed, genuinely revealed in, the, in that space. In that space right there, you can start to understand how, how strong your faith is really is. And so Peter says, it's through this refining fire that you actually get to see the authenticity, the genuineness of it. The fire just reveals the purity of which God has already granted you. The fire just sort of brings those things to the surface. And the way we choose to live in the middle of the pain of our life is the way that we uh, honor and respect the fact that this life isn't all there is to this life. The way we choose to stand in the middle of grief the middle of pain, the middle of health crises, the middle of war and famine and all those things demonstrates that God is working, God's life is working in this life right now. The life that he wants for you one day can be your life right now. You can step into it right now and you may not see it with your eyes. 
And Peter's, Peter's clear about that. You may not actually see this. You may not hold it in your hands, but that's okay. Peter says, although you have not seen him. I saw him, Peter says. I walked with him, but many of you have not. Even though you do not see him, you love him as if you did. Now imagine the depths of that for just a minute. I just try to love deeply someone you've never seen in your lives. But Peter says, you've not been able to see him, but you love him. I know you do. And even though you don't see him right now and in this space, you still believe in him. You believe that he can do amazing things. And so once again, he says, look, you're already standing in this, so listen to me. Rejoice. Rejoice. Choose to have that joy. Rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. The fullness of the resurrection, it's not here, right? We don't see that yet. There's much of our hearts that mourn and are, are in pain and struggling every single day. The completion of our salvation, it's not yet arrived. But it will. And it's coming. And even, even now, there is change available for you. There's a change that you can experience. We can still love Christ. We can still believe in Him, even when life is at its worst. And guess what? In the midst of that, as Peter says... You are still receiving the outcome of your faith. Not one day. You will receive one day. You are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And this is really where I want to land everything this morning. This is where I want to settle it in right, right quickly. Yeah, there's going to be a resurrection day one day. Absolutely. The graves will break open. Those who are dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are remaining will rise and meet him in the air. That's what Paul says in Thessalonians. That great resurrection morning is coming. Dawn will break in and transform all of our reality. That's what will happen. But while we're standing here this morning, I don't want to just talk to you about dawn as a noun. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about dawn as a verb. Dawn is coming. It will happen. We'll celebrate it on Easter Sunday like it has happened. But there's another way that you can use dawn. Dawn is not just a noun, as dawn has arrived this morning. Dawn is a verb, as if it dawned upon me. And here's what I believe for your life. There is a dawn that needs to happen in our lives. There's a dawn that needs to happen in our lives that occurs somewhere deep inside of our souls. Something deep in here. And when we say, it dawned upon me. Something I didn't see before, something I didn't know before. It just sort of bubbles out of my life. And when it bubbles out of my life, I start living in a brand new, de- in a brand new way. When I see, say that dawn is coming, what I'm hoping for you in this season of life is that there'll be a new dawn that comes inside of you to live in a different way. God wants to do something in you right now. There's a brand new way of being a human being. There's a brand new way of approaching hardship in the world. There's a brand new way of approaching grief and trials and fatigue and relational issues. There's a brand new way of approaching money and and family relationships. There's a brand new way of doing all of this. And God wants you to have that not after we die. Not after the resurrection morning comes. Not after that dawn comes. But he wants the dawn to happen now inside of you. To where you can experience all of those things. And one day that will happen. But before that happens, God can dawn something in your life. Before the noon dawn fully comes, God's reality can dawn in our lives. You know, the irony of this entire situation is, is if you think about nature for just a minute, the longest, darkest part of night comes just before the most brilliant part of day. The moment in the night where everything is dark and everything is hard and it's difficult to take another step because you're like, I'm so frustrated with living through this dark night in my soul. It's right there that the brightness of the new day comes. And it's not sunrise. We don't talk about sunrise as being, you know, when the sun is risen, that's not the beautiful part. My son has a wonderful way of doing this when he gets up in the morning and I open the curtains and it's, it's dawn time. It's cotton candy in the sky. Right? That's what he says. You've seen this. You look out your windows, and it's not the sun is up. It's that dawn has come. And just before the sun fully rises in our lives, that's the space where the most brilliant colors can be found. That's the space where our lives can find so much meaning and hope. It's in the deepness of that night, just before dawn, that those bright colors come out. 
And those bright colors can transform us and renew us. And that's what I want for you. I don't want us to sit as a group of followers of Christ who are just waiting for that day. I want us to walk every single day in the power of that resurrection hope. Here's a story told, and I'll make this as quick as possible. It's a story told of an individual over in Tennessee who, uh, who was gifted at one point in time this, this yellow scroll of a declaration of independence. And he got it as a single dude, and it was great. And he was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I like this. And he just shoved it in his garage. He had a ton of stuff. He was a pack rat. And then he got married. And as he was getting married, his wife's like, some stuff's got to go, right? It's got to go. We got to get it out of here. And uh, so they started going through all the stuff, you know, like throwing it out. We're going to trash it. We're going to donate it. Are we going to keep it? And the whole thing. They went to the garage. They started doing this. And as they were going through it, he's like, or she pulls this out and she goes, are we going to keep this or give it away? And he's like, give it away. Give it away. I, I mean, it's been here. It's just taken up. You see, I haven't even taken it out of the plastic sleeve. It's just sitting there. I've not done anything. So they gave it away. They gave it away to this local music shop in uh, Nashville, I believe. And a few days went by, and another individual came into the music shop, and he was standing there, and he was looking through the bin of posters and, you know, getting his old Kiss concert poster, whatever. He was, I don't know what he was doing. That's Nashville. He probably wasn't getting Kiss. It was something else, you know, Garth Brooks from the 90s. I don't know. He was getting these posters out, and then he found this. And he's like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like, I could see me, myself doing some stuff with that. And so he pulled it out, this yellow copy of the Declaration of Independence, and he took it home, paid two, I think it was $2.47 or something like that, this Declaration of Independence. And then one day, somebody came over to his house who dabbled into antiques, and he's like, that's, that's really unique. He's like, yeah, yeah, I've got it down the shop for two forty. dollars He's like, you ever had an appraiser or anything? And he's like, well, it's just a poster. It's just, he's like, you really should. He fast forwarded the end. He did. He found out how much it was worth. $400,000 later, he sells that copy, one of 200 copies of the Declaration of Independence that was signed by the original ones, and, and it was 200 copies all signed by the, the originators of the Declaration of Independence and sent out around the world. This man sat for, on $400,000 for 20 years of his life. Is that on four hundred thousand dollars for twenty years? And I, I hate to see the argument that he and his wife had later. I don't want to know that. And I guarantee you, he is a worse pack rat today than he ever was before. But this is my hope for you. Don't sit on the value that you have in your soul. Don't sit on it. Don't wait for one day the resurrection morning to come and all that be changed. You have an inheritance at your fingertips that is imperishable, unfading, and immeasurable in terms of worth. And yet as people of faith, we often sit on that and don't share that and don't carry that into our lives and don't allow that to change everything around us because we're waiting for that one day to come. Don't do that. And over the next few days, we're gonna, or, or the next few weeks, we're gonna dig even deeper into this and talk about the way that Peter says Christ's life can become our life. We can embody the holiness that is God's. We can look like God. We can act like God. We can do all of those things as we live into the power of God. And that's my prayer for you, that you would live into those graces even now. And as we close this morning, that's exactly what we take a step to do. Gathering around this table, remembering that the inheritance that will come to us one day when we are with Christ is still part of us today. We experience the body and the blood of Christ, the forgiveness and grace that comes through His brokenness and the shedding of His blood, and the healing that can come to us in our brokenness and shedding of, of our blood. So today, I want to invite you into that space where you start to step in to the inheritance of Christ even now. Would you stand with me and let us pray? Gracious God, we thank you so much for the resurrection hope that we hold in our hands and in our minds, but God, that resurrection hope that seeks deep down into our souls, transforms all of who we are and all of who we hope to be. 
It gives us a new way of being human in the world. It gives us a new way of exercising our hospitality in the world, of exercising our graces in the world and our gifts. It gives us a new way, God, of existing in this space, a way that looks a lot like you, a way that models your life for us. And it's all there. By the power of the resurrection, we step into it. And today, as we gather around your table, God, we gather in this space realizing that even these simple elements of bread and juice remind us of the way that you are with us now, giving us gifts and graces beyond our mind. We thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.